welcome to The Lion Show. I'm your host, your favorite business coach, Robert Lyon. Today, we have the great pleasure of talking to Lisa Brum. She is CEO of My Financial Girlfriend, an amazing woman, and I'm just so excited to have her on the show today. So Lisa, why don't you introduce yourself and kind of tell everybody who you are and what you're all about. Thank you, Robert. Yes, um, I am Lisa Brum. My company is My Financial Girlfriend, and we are a full-service educational and marketing firm helping all Americans, uh, but we do focus with women on finance and money and all the things that uh, goes with that, you know, the emotional side and the, you know, real life side of how money could maybe be more optimized for people. That's awesome. And uh, I usually like to ask people that, you know, that are CEOs and have started this company, what, what, what is the story that kind of started it and kind of got you inspired to do this? Oh, well, that's a great story. I'll try to keep it short. Uh, <laughs> I live here in Portland, Oregon, went to Portland State uh, thinking I was going to have a French degree. And I ended up having to take one of those silly things called, uh, called an elective class. And I think I just foolishly clicked the first one on the box, which was an accounting 101 course. And um, through my college years, I realized that the creative side was the language and the social econ economies, but on the, the accounting side, it was really about the, the dollars and figures and numbers, just having a place, a place for everything, everything in a place. And it was very logical, rational. I ended up working for First Interstate Bank, which got taken over as a hostile takeover in the early 90s by Wells Fargo. And that was an interesting transition. And um, I guess looking back, the leap that I took to be a financial planner, advisor, licensed financial professional, was that um, in the banking years, you had the authority to waive a fee or just make it right. Like if a client came in, they were upset about something. I was a branch manager at that time, and I would just make it right with them or call the department to do the thing that they needed to have done and, and just kind of cut to the chase. And so when I left the bank because of the hostile takeover, I had some time to spend and kind of analyze what was the thing that I love to do, what stirs me up in the morning, what right? throws me out of bed, um, where I have purpose and, and really feel that I'm accomplishing Uh and it was really about just educating people about money and working from the bank was kind of an interesting perspective because I always wanted the consumer to see what happens behind the scenes and how things happen, like a mortgage or a Visa card, merchant services, something like that. And so we really just kind of unveiled a lot of just the mystery about money. And that's really how I feel like I, I started my company about five. Well, I start, I thought about it five years ago. I started it about three and a half years ago. And um, the thing that really just inspired me is that I'm all about the financial and understanding and being curious about resources and how to dig out the truth. But I'm also just as much the girlfriend that will tell you the straight scoop. And I will, <laughs> I will offer up ideas that I can see might fit better with one person's style or personality versus another. And it's not, it's not all roads just lead to one answer. It's your answer based on your preferences. So I really cater and we try to exceed people's expectations in the fact that they're getting knowledge along the way. That's awesome. Yeah. I always thought if I got a job at a bank, I would just like see how much money there actually is. And it would just kind of like blow my mind openly to so many things. So in your, uh, in your career and as you do this, what do you think the, the number one uh, biggest problem people have with their finances and with their, their money mindsets? And things? Uh, well, I think we talked about this a little bit, but I really think that it's the block. There's a block or barrier to take, tackling it until it's a crisis, right? I mean, like you have your washing machine blows up and you don't have $400 sitting in your savings account. So you, th you run to Home Depot because the kids need laundry the next day or whatever. And you just kind of make decisions under crisis, under emergencies. And so you run to Home Depot and maybe get the 90 day same as cash or something and you get it installed and you have them take the other one away and then you get the bill like 45 days later, right? Nobody's like, oh, what? how am I gonna do this, right? So we're all just trying to do things with a Band-Aid instead of really taking a moment or having someone like a financial girlfriend to have a phone call away and just say, hey, what's my best option? What are the, here are some of my things that I'm thinking about, what's gonna be the best way to, to approach this or, or what bucket should I take this money from and how fast can I replace it? And so we really look at just pretty much anybody who asks us how questions about money is going to kind of get the, the full walkthrough and all the different processes that that can 
that can either help or, you know, pros and cons of every decision. We really want to help empower people to kind of think that way and, and not just, you know, in a rash or in an emergency have to deal with it. I mean, sometimes you have to, right? But to set up money in a way that's going to be more fruitful for you and or perhaps hopefully over time become a really strong foundation so that no matter what happens, who's in the White House, what emergency comes up, what your paycheck looks like now or goes down to or, or stops altogether, or all the different things that we're dealing with currently in America. Um, we just want you to have backup contingency possibilities and that you already kind of have that in, as a proactive measure already in your plan, right? Mm -hmm. So what do you recommend? Like my dad hides money in like sock drawers, you know, you just squirrel it away. Like what do you, what is the, what's the best way to take active action so you can really do this and live a financial life. Yeah. Your dad, my mom, my mom was born in 1925 and second oldest to 13. Yeah. So uh, she squirreled money in Folgers cans in the, in, you know, the spice cabinet. She had the pin money in her sock drawer. She had another little jar underneath, you know, in the back of the closet. And um, I think that mindset is really interesting because <laughs> They, they're always, you know, they're, they're talking about, they're already thinking about all the possibility negative things that could happen, right? They're already going to have access to cash, no matter what day or time of, uh, you know, what day or time it is. So I think that a lot of Americans are so poorly educated around money. And sometimes we don't seek that out, that it's, it becomes very, it's a huge obstacle and mostly it's about mindset and just knowing that you have access to people and or companies that are willing to help you without, you know, without a price tag on it or without any kind of, um, you know, negative connotation or feeling judged or feeling shameful that you paid your rent on a visa card because you lost your job. It just, it's your survival mode. And that's kind of the way we look at it. You, you didn't do it because you purposely tried to do it that way. You did it because you had to, and you just had to get through it. And without having any resources, that's probably what it was the best thing to do for you right there. Yeah. What, um, what really excites you about the, my, my financial girlfriend and doing this good work? <sighs> Well, to be honest, I really feel that our methodology of how we approach and how consumers see us working with them is kind of new. It's a whole unique business model that for the most part is not, not out there on, you know, very prevalent. I think I call us, we're kind of unicorns in a financial industry that is archaic and old and <laughs> kind of stuffy, right? Not really yeah. very personable. They're more about numbers and charts and graphs. And we're really about people and the relationship that you have with your money and the relationship about asking enough questions and understanding so that you really can, you know, I always say we try to fit, let you or teach you how to fish than just to hand you a fish. We want you to really understand because it's not rocket science. It's right. just a matter of kind of un, unpeeling that onion one layer at a time. And it may take some time to do that. Yeah, I'm talking about it with somebody. Like I, said, aha, I guess the, the thing that inspires me is those aha moments. Like, hmm. why didn't anybody ever tell me that I should pay my credit card off this way? Or yeah. how come I didn't know that I should do my W2 or W4 for my job this way? So I get more money on my paycheck than to have to owe a bunch of money to Uncle Sam. Yeah, I really love the idea of your relationship with money. So can you maybe talk a little bit about how you like, what, do you, what is the right relationship to have with money? Um, I think there's, there's going to be an emotional pull either way, right? I mean, we have, you know, if you have a plenty of money in your checking account, you're kind of like, oh, great. You know, especially I see entre entrepreneurs like kind of laxing off a little bit, not having systems that help them develop more. It's like, oh, everything's covered. I'm good for a good five, five, six months. And then all of a sudden they let up, but they've let up on the marketing. So it's not keeping the bucket keep, or pipeline full, right? So I think a lot of the emotion around money needs to kind of come to more of a balanced approach so that you, and, and don't be afraid of it. Or don't be afraid of talking about it. And I think, I think one thing that we might end up unveiling out of all of this process of this new way of doing financial planning is to have a really healthy relationship about talking about money, not feeling judged or shamed or anxious about it. And really just you know, looking forward to the way that you can plan ahead. And it could be just, you know, short term, maybe a couple of weeks in ahead. But once you get those kind of 
nuggets in your brain, it really becomes more of like your habit of just knowing that you, where your awareness of money is. Sometimes the hardest work is just getting it set up, but then letting some of it just be on autopilot and having an awareness of how it's working. I think that's what good business owners really achieve is that kind of balance of knowing where their money's at what bucket is used for what purpose and the intention of how to get more of it into those buckets. I love that. So I'm an entrepreneur and, you know, sometimes my money is, you know, amazing. And then sometimes it is, there's just nothing. Yeah. <laughs> so what do you, how do you help people financially plan in that kind of situation? Or what is your advice? Yeah. The one formula that I generally can help entrepreneurs start with is consistency. The more you can build into your, you can't really help the consistency of when a client's going to buy or when you're going to have that service available, but you do have a lot of control on your expenses. So the formula is really, you know, more money, you make more money, you spend less, and then you get your, your, you know, the after amount, whether it's gross or after taxes. So if we have a really good control over our fixed expenses, the reoccurring bills, that always show up, you know, your website or your employees or whatever it is, you just have to have, um, you know, really always keep analyzing, how can I get this more bells and whistles for less money that you're having to put out? That's the first one, especially, and it's kind of been more prevalent even during this pandemic is that, you know, we've been able to take some time and reassess, is that really the fee that I want to pay to my bank? Or should I go and do something different and how we can set that up? So a lot of times it's just looking and really analyzing each of your, your expenses and how consistent you can keep that. Um, the second one I would think is um, a lot of us do tend to market and then kind of gather, right? So I was, I think of it as uh, planting or gardening. It's like you plant your seeds and you hope they're going to start sprouting. But once you start seeing those first couple of things sprout, you kind of just concentrate all your time there and you forget about the other ones that are late bloomers, right? Mm -hmm. And we just really have to be more consistent or set up systems that allow you to just be as consistent as possible month over month over month. And and for me, I, I've been an entrepreneur now for 24 years and I can tell you that there's seasons to money. There's, you know, tax season. It's kind of right now. Everybody's gearing up to get ready to do their taxes. And then there's summer kind of lays low and people are spending more time outdoors and on their vacations. And then the fall comes around and for business owners, they're now thinking about, oh, now I got to make sure I have enough to kind of squirrel away to cut cover and get me through to the next season. And so every just knowing and your cycles and your business flow of how and when those times occur and or why they're occurring that way, you know, taking the analysis on, how is it that we get more clients in, you know, February than we do in March or maybe fall like October or November? So understanding your flow and understanding the methods that you're using to attract new clients. Yeah, I think it was Jim Rohn. He used to like watch ants and he says, always, always be thinking winter. Ants are always thinking winter. There's gather, 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 always be thinking winter. Exactly. Um, so I always have uh, quite a few people um, who want help getting out of debt. So mm -hmm. what, um, what advice can you give to everybody listening and myself as well to how to get out of debt and how to make a plan maybe? Yeah. Okay. So I can tell you as a, an industry professional that most uh, financial advisors or investment uh, advisors will not even talk to you about debt. And I can tell you that that's one of the areas that I have the most fun. And I really am using the word fun here <laughs> because um, especially if it's credit card debt or revolving debt, um, there are formulas, there are mathematical ways to pay your debt down faster than the, especially the credit card companies want you to know about. And um, one or two tricks, just understanding how principal and interest payments are being accrued against you is so huge. So I always use this as an example. If you have a credit card bill and the minimum due on the fifth says $72, I know that most of us think, I'll say a majority of the people that I talk to think, oh, if I send them $100, that means $28, the difference between what the minimum and the 100 is actually going to go to my principal, when in fact, it does not. In fact, sometimes you could be actually paying like $82 worth of interest when you send it all in one statement, one payment, mm -hmm. and they may only apply $21 to to the principal and you go, well, how did they do that? What's wrong here? And it's because in 2000, the Federal Credit Act was adopted by Congress and 
inside that act that was, you know, two feet long or two feet deep in reading um, one same sentence in there. And it was a bill that was introduced by credit card company lobbyists that said, I will take a 12% interest rate. If that was the going rate in the eighties, late eighties, early nineties, um, then they were used to be able to divide it by 12 and it would be a, a 1% per month against the outstanding balance. But in 2001, when the act actually became uh, in effect, they were able to take that same interest rate and divide it by 365 days. And somebody might have read that and go, well, what's the big deal? And math is math, right? Mm -hmm. But what happens is now most credit card, major credit card companies are using that as a daily per diem percentage against your outstanding balance daily. So it actually grows until it gets to the due date. And so when that $72 shows up on your bill, most of it is like 68 of it might go to interest and only a few dollars go to the principal. And when you send in a payment all by itself as a $100 payment, then they're taking the whole amount and dividing it by that 365 pro rata. And that's how you end up spending more in interest than actually going more to the print or any of it going to the principal that you think it's going to go. It's, it's really deceivious. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's, it's, that's some sneaky stuff. I got to go It's Google very sneaky. <laughs> and I always say, well, think about it. How many major cities have you ever visited? Who owns the tallest buildings? Right. Financial yeah. institutions, investment companies, banks, insurance. They know how to make money on their money and they're constantly doing that. And so the only way to break that cycle and get more of your money, and going back to that example of $100, you pay the 72 on or before the due date and then set up an auto pay for $28 a day or two later, because after that first payment has been made, then the clock starts and now you're only got one or two days of accrued interest against your $28. And so you flipped it. Now you've got like maybe $26 going to the principal and only $2.12 going to the interest because it was only two days of accrued interest. And that's really how you beat, it's like a forced principal only payment. Wow, well. That was the mind blown. Scoop. Yeah, mind blown. <laughs> I need you to tell money. me all, all your financial secrets now. That was cool. <laughs> it's I get a lot of skeptics. I mean, and sometimes they're I wouldn't say I'll say most credit card companies do that. Some mortgages I've seen do that, which is kind of even more interesting. Yeah. Um, generally, you could just look by like if you are the type of person that rounds up. If you never really pay a minimum payment, and, and I find that, you know, 80% of the people do, mm -hmm. there's studies that show women always round up. But um, if you tend to round up, then I said, just break it up. And then you definitely get more bang for your buck out of that. But honestly, we, we help people with that one calculation take, you know, years and years and years off their payments and pay it off much faster. Oh, yeah. That, that could definitely free a few people. That's incredible. Yeah. You got any other tips for getting out of debt? Uh, yeah, uh, especially nowadays, uh, you know, use use the any deal that they've got going on. You know, when credit card companies, uh, much like, you know, retail, I always use Coke and Pepsi, right? Have you ever yeah. gone shopping and you walk down the aisle one week and all the Pepsi products are on sale? You know, buy three cases for five dollar, whatever it is. Yeah. And then you go down the next week and all the Coke, pro all the Coke products are on sale. How is it that they're per perfectly timing the sale of their product? It's because they have so much shel shelf space and they've actually bought the privilege to have a special going on and it's back and forth. So the same happens for your credit card companies. You know, mm -hmm. one bank might offer zero interest rate for 12 months. And then all of a sudden you might see in your mailbox and, you know, five more offers at, you know, 18 months at 0%. So if you're smart about it and you're, and you feel like you can stay on top of it, I always have, you know, somebody brings me their credit card statements. We always try to call the bank that they're working with and see if they have a deal of the day going on. You know, huh. is there some kind of deal going on? Can I get this balance transferred over to another card at zero interest rate or 1.9 and you're paying 17 or 18%. So always try, that's another thing that can be consistent is always try to hash out the interest rate that you're paying. You know, you got there because maybe you didn't have the savings, yeah. but getting into a debt plan is really one of the best ways to to know that again, have a plan around debt, it does two things. I see it makes people force them to make more money or, or look for opportunities because now their brain is not thinking about the debt because they got a plan around it. And any new money that comes in, 
split the difference. Don't just throw all, like I have a lot of clients right now going, Hey, I'm getting a stimulus check. Should I throw my $600 to this credit card? And I'll say, well, what got, you know, let's talk about how you got into debt. How come you still have an outstanding revolving balance? Let's split it $300 into a savings and 300 to your lump sum with maybe an extra 25 or $30 going out towards your payments Mm -hmm. in the same time frame. Are we going to have no debt and a savings balance, or are we just going to have no debt? And so yeah. I always want the gravy on top of my potatoes, right? I want to have all the bells and whistles with the same dollar amounts. And that's the kind of questions I'm always, you know, the devil's advocate trying to bounce questions off of others to see, well, what would you prefer? Yeah. All debt free in 38 months or debt free in 26 months and have a savings of $5,000 or whatever those numbers look like. <laughs> yeah. Are there ways to consolidate all your all your debt into one payment, or do you have to always just keep calling every credit card company to pay it can't, off? Yeah, I mean, with based on your credit, you know, there's three things, the three C's, if you will, on on debt is your collateral or your credit score and your cash flow. So, being a solo entrepreneur, being somebody who owns a business, you're always going. They're always going to look at two years worth of cash flow. And two years, of, you know, and look at your credit history if you're getting a personal loan and make sure that if there isn't collateral, they want to, they'll really rely on your credit score and your cash flow to be able to do that. So, yeah, I've seen, um, I've seen some pretty cool deals lately with local banks because, again, they know you're going to get better servicing and they also can underwrite personally based on circumstances. And right now with pandemic and everything that's going on, there's just so many ways that, you um, lenders and banks and financial companies are trying to aid to the degree they can because small business is the cornerstone of the economy and you can't have all of them you know fold so they're going to be doing a little bit i think there's going to be generous more federal money and stuff but on a local you know having a debt with a bank you are you are uh, an asset to them. You're, mm-hmm. it's, it's your liability, but you become an asset to them because you're going to be paying interest possibly, and you're going to be paying those, those dollars back to them. So the idea is that you want to always assess and always, uh, you know, Google it. I mean, honestly, there's yeah. just so many different plans and programs out there that, you know, know, know which ones are legitimate or even ask, you know, other financial professionals in your, in your circle, right? Your CPA, an attorney, mm-hmm. um, just, you know, Facebook is a great resource for, <laughs> hey, does anybody know of, and, you know, and get, and get some other input about how to find a, the best deal going. Yeah. I'm always um, also trying to improve my credit. So you got any tips on improving credit scores? Yeah. There's a lot of ways that you can, um, especially if you're paying on time, right? You're going to mm-hmm. always want to pay on time uh, payments, but improving a credit score generally can take 30 to 60 days. Um and, you know, I, I can't say I, I've helped. Basically, I will look at it and help them. I mean, I, I think in my whole career, I've only I've only said maybe to two or three people that they were kind of beyond help at that point And bankruptcy mm-hmm. was an option. But other than that, there's generally always a way I you know what I do find is that when people are paying that extra I and mean, maybe a hundred dollars or a couple hundred dollars towards their debt, usually it's that extra payment that could actually be utilized. And sometimes you do it now, you might have heard this differently, but sometimes don't go for the highest interest rate always. Sometimes based on the how much you have, look for the lowest balance on any credit card and attack that one first. Because yes, you may be paying a little bit more in interest over time, but it also helps your mindset to go, oh God, I just got this one that's only $800 debt. And now I can chunk away that payment towards these bills. And so, and don't just get, don't, that's the other thing. Don't give up. If you're always putting a thousand dollars out towards credit card debt or any kind of debt, when one gets paid off, just keep thinking a thousand dollars. How am I going to apply the rest of the, don't ever stop paying your payments that of the debt that got paid off. Just keep rolling it into the next debt, into the next debt. And that way you all shorten the time frame much faster. Nice. I guess this is just a selfish question, but I'm going to be applying for the, the, whatever the grants and the PPP loans and everything, mm-hmm. you got any insight on, on those? I mean, I bet you're getting a lot of questions right now. About that. Yeah. The um, EIDL is, is based on credit score. So um, again, if you have a decent, and I would say decent credit score is like over 650, 680. So, you yeah. know, if you're over those numbers, you're most likely going to get an SBA economic uh, disaster relief, right? That's the yeah. loan that's out there now. And um, I have clients who've applied for it and never really needed to 
use it. And if they don't end up using it or some of it can be, you know, used, but then paid back within that, that time frame, then, you know, there's no, it's only a 1%, I believe, or 2% interest and they get 15 years to pay it off or 20 years yeah. maybe. So there's um, the new one, the PPP two is a, just opened up last week. Um, I, I would have you go to the sba.gov website and look for banks. There's, there's a whole directory of which banks, if you already have a banking relationship with any of the ones that are listed, go to those ones first because they're the ones that are going to have already have a lot of your history and information there. Um, and I believe most of the PPP2 loans out there are also going to be waivable. And you just have to show a little bit different. I think you have to have at least 25% less in revenue than you did o- over last year's same time frame. So there's a couple of pieces there that are, I think are going to be very helpful to most people. And there's still hopefully new stimulus money coming forward with the new administration. So yeah. I think, um, yes, apply if you can, even if you don't feel like you need it, because, because again, having a bankable cash reserves will always get you through that pinch of when you don't have the income necessarily coming in as, as strong as it was. Yeah. I think I've been kind of blessed and actually made more money in 2020 than I did in 2019. See, so. and that, that speaks to opportunity, <laughs> right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You didn't let it get you down. You didn't let it, you know, you didn't let it stop you from pursuing and doing the things that you're helping others do. So. Yeah, so. definitely. Um, you mentioned kind of at the beginning of the show that you you also have, think that the, the system is kind of rigged against uh, lower income and things like that. You kind of want to speak a little bit a bit about that. Yeah, I think there's a big, um, you know, financial industry as a whole uh, have have these myths that I want to break open. Yeah. Um, women and people of color, BIPOC people, have generally been dismissed or ignored as viable consumers when a financial advisor is out looking for new clients. And it's because they use it against us, but they, women t- typically and, and people of color typically have the lower end, lower paying jobs. And we don't necessarily make as much money as to someone in our same position that's a male. Um, so knowing that they're not like, not everyone's hunting us down to, to open up that $50 mutual fund once a month, right? And yeah. so they generally, they ignore us and they ignore us to the extent that we are wasting their time. And that's the hugest myth I want to break open is because there are a lot of, you know, a lot of good financial advisors out there will take the time, will not charge you an hourly rate and really help you get financially your good footing and then help you make a decision because here's the one thing that I know again go back to math but somebody who makes 30 say 35 to 40 thousand dollars a year let's say they're in their you know just coming out of college or maybe they're just you know trying to get their new job or new business going and they may say oh I'm not making much money but think about how old they are and how much longer they're going to be on this planet and I look at those numbers and go multimillionaire. It may take them until they're 60 or 55 years old. But if you're working with someone, um, some of the just statistics that are out there is when somebody actually finds a good financial person, who will sit down with them and really help them work out a plan on each and every aspect of how their money is working for them. They're going to make more money. They're going to have more hopefully assets over that same time frame. And generally there's some statistics out there is when you work with a female financial advisor, we're more, we're more prudent about decisions, but we actually take a little bit more risk and you can generally get a greater rate of return. So when you look at that as a whole, women and people of color are actually a very large portion of the workforce. And we also have the more ability to make more money if we have the right guidance and education. So, and when women and BIPOC and people make big money, communities thrive better, families are protected, kids get educated, stay healthy, have good food, food sources, and they actually can eventually make more money themselves with better education coming out of you know, that kind of a family situation. So I'm all about having as many people making big money as possible, but especially women. Oh, it's so (laughs) awesome. 
Um, so I'm just pretty curious about um, like financial coaching and being a financial coach yourself. Like um, what does it look like when you bring somebody on? Like, what do you look at? How do you kind of get it organized to the, so that they can succeed? Yeah. I have a couple of tools that I use, but really it's four areas. It's cash flow. It's kind of the foundation. I, I think of a yeah. house, right? You have a really good, strong foundation. That's the cash flow. So we might take a little bit of time and knowing how it comes in and how it goes out what's left behind, if any. We look at assets and liabilities. So that's that debt picture. But it also is tax debt because that is the liability on every dollar you make, whether you work for a company or you work for yourself. So assets and debt. And then the roof over your house is the protection elements. You know, how are you paying for your car insurance? I mean, it may seem like a silly thing to say. I don't sell car insurance, but I know how the premium is calculated. And if I have a fairly nice car and I have full coverage, and I caused the accident, yeah, I kind of want my car put back to normal and back to, you know, the state of which I drove it the day before. Yeah. And um, when you pay deductibles, that's what the deductible is dictating how much in premium you're paying. So I see a lot, of, I ask people to send me a copy of their car insurance, even their home insurance, because a lot of times that extra de- collision ex- ex- expense is, is almost as, as much, if you're not all, uh, you know, more than what your liability cost is. If you have like a 250 deductible, because I think, and I don't blame it on the people that are helping you get your car insurance, but nobody really asks those bigger questions. So how, how the, you know, health insurance, if you're self-employed, do you have disability insurance? Do you have any of the insurances that you may already have? Are they working for you? Are they going to continue to work for you? Um, Legal documents, leases, and, contracts, uh, make sure that you have a will in place. If you have people that you care about that you want to leave things behind for. So, um, we kind of just kind of take a glimpse at all those four areas, cash flow, assets, liabilities, and your protection pieces in place. Wow. So yeah, I think it's just like with most things in life, you probably have to have like a, a long-term goal, you know, and you kind of want to visualize and know where you're going and know what you want. And then, you just need to get like your finances in line and, and then your actions in line. And then, you know, you can just kind of slowly start making your way there. Right. Is that kind of what yeah. you help people do? And then you a lot of times them. I'll ask, what's your target? Like, even if it's a short term target, though, somebody say, oh, I want to buy a house. Well, do you want to do that this spring? Do you want to do it by the end of the year for a tax credit? Do you want to do it next spring? Um, and we talk about what are their resources? It may not be, I have 50,000 sitting in a savings account ready for a down payment. It may be, I already own a property or, or I have a 401k plan and you can borrow from your 401k and repay yourself through your payroll to get into a house because there's tax code and tax credit gives you benefit and doesn't penalize you to do so. So again, strategically, there are resources that most people don't see as a resource and they're, again, they're kind of just going along with the rut and not realizing that they have a- assets that they don't even really count towards their goals. And so whether it's short-term, mid-range or long-term, we'll help them in all of those aspects. You just, again, I say, ask me a how question. My husband does this. We've been together for 34 years, but he'll say, hey, Lisa, how can we go on four vacations this year and make sure Pearl finishes school, you know, have enough money for her college education? And, you know, the minute he asks me that how question, it sticks in my brain until I can maybe recalculate or relook at what we have and what we're trying to accomplish. So I do it all the time. That's just yeah. how my brain is, is working. <laughs> well, that's good though. <laughs> it works for you. <laughs> <laughs> and my clients benefit of that too. And I think that's why it, it makes me happy to see clients reach even, you know, this what they consider silly goals. And like, it's not silly if you thought of it, if you, if you wanted to pay your car off so that you could buy a newer car or you wanted to, you know, lease a car because you're self-employed and you want to take a tax break on that. So I think tax code and fees and the way that you look at your money is really uh, over is overlooked most of the time when we can help you find more money in your money. Yeah, definitely. As an entrepreneur, I pay like a ridiculous amount in taxes. So I definitely probably need somebody to talk to about that at some point. So. Yep. There's, there's, you know, what I say with being an entrepreneur and tax code, think about tax code in the history of the United States was primarily written for business owners. And yeah. in our minds, you know, if you're a solo entrepreneur and you think, oh, that we're just talking about people who own major corporations with tons of zeros and commas buying their net worth, right? Mm-hmm. Nope. It's, it's scalable. No matter where you are on that scale, all Americans have access to the same tax code. And we just want to utilize those pieces 
to fit. And not all CPAs really help you find that. Usually they're trying to make more money year over year. Yeah. I have really good friends that are CPAs and they admit this, that they're just give me what you got and I'll get it right and accurate. But they really aren't pro. There are a few, but not all of them are pro <laughs> proactively looking forward for you to find more taxes unless something pops up or something, you know, is a different from the year before. Yeah. And so they usually have ranges. And so I always, I always have my clients have me help review their taxes before they submit them because I'll be looking for some of the blank boxes that aren't even there. And generally we help people again, get more money back or pay less money out and be able to retain some of that in their own pockets. Yeah. That's so cool. Um, do you have any like training on my financial girlfriend or is it all just you? Yeah, actually I just, I'm starting a, something called financial girlfriend Academy. It starts Ooh. on February 2nd. It is meant for mostly uh, licensed financial professionals. Now I'm doing a beta test with 10 to 12 and um, it's a six week master class that's going on once a week. And we're going to go through aspects of everything that we've just talked about. Cool. Um and then uh, as, as I'm beta testing, then I will most likely start offering that to consumers and still know that you have, you know, to be a financial girlfriend just means that you're trying to, you know, be more resourceful and figure mm -hmm. out where all those money hacks lay inside of your own money. And that's really what we're going to be doing. Awesome. What do you have to do to become a, a licensed financial person. <laughs> yeah, there's generally uh, three tests. Uh, so depending on federally, there's a, it's called the securities test is either a six or a seven. And those numbers just mean that this, the seven really can do everything. They can do the stocks, the bonds, the mutual funds, everything. With the six, it, it just precludes you from doing individual stocks or bonds. So six huh. or seven. And then on the state level, there's um, a 63 or a 65 or a 66. It's also a, a securities license through the states. And those also kind of correlate to if you have a start out, I, I just say start with a seven. It gives you the most options to everything, even if you don't want to be a day trader or something like that. Yeah. Um, and then there's, and then most will also get a life insurance license because that also opens up the door for insurance type of products that also have investments built into them, like annuities and life insurance and such. So um, yeah, it, those two licenses for the securities, the life then also gives you options for insurance, uh, insurance investment type plans. So you just have to take the test? I mean, you got to study for Free it, tests. obviously. Yeah. So you study yeah. for this. So each test would be about 40 hours or so of study. And then it's a, and then it's about, I think each of the securities is like a 300, they give you, I think up to four hours to finish it. And it's a 300 question test. One of them is a 150 for the state level. Um, but yeah, it takes about, I, every test is about 40 hours worth of study. And then you schedule yourself to take the test and they give you, most people find that that's enough time and you have to pass with the greater than a 75% on each of the tests to pass. Yeah. And then once, and then you have, you can, if you have the seven and the 65 or 66, you actually then can be a registered investment advisor and then nice. um, mentoring with someone for five years, then you can take the CFP, which is the certified financial planning certification. And it oh, just wow. means that you've had more study and you're, you've been in the industry for greater than five years. Cool. Yeah. I've always kind of wondered that. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. Well, why don't you tell everybody kind of the best ways to get in contact with you and where you are online. So they can sure. Well, we have a website, which is www.myfinancialgirlfriend.com. And on there is all of our phone numbers, uh, all of our locations. L literally, I started the year off with uh, a location in Florida and a location in Texas and then I'm here in Portland, Oregon, and um, we have, we're licensed in 16 states. My vision of the company is to have it all across all 50 and to have people just have approachable financial girlfriend centers everywhere so that people can just bring in their questions and not feel like they're being judged or shamed into doing something that they really get the help that they're looking for. Yeah, that's awesome. Definitely gave us the, the financial scoop. So I really appreciate that so much. Yes, <laughs> I think absolutely. Listening did too. <laughs> yeah, I always um, say anything that I say is totally Googleable. So I have to just, I'm going to just tell you how it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, no, I loved it. I, I definitely learned a lot. I know everybody else listening did too. Um, I think just thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate yeah. it. Thank you for the All opportunity. Right. Yeah. Thank you, everybody listening and uh, take care. I'll talk to you next time.